just give me a minute i'm having okay yeah let's begin so uh beginning with a quote that is uh open the window of fantasy to know what reality can bring as oxymoronic as it may sound magic realism is real it is a style that incorporates fantastic elements into otherwise realist fiction but this is just the beginning good evening to all this is aditi dudeja your host for the evening on behalf of the english association of atmaram college i would like to welcome you all to a lecture on magic realism by our distinguished speaker dr amrita das ma'am specializes in contemporary us latino literature and culture also has an interest in contemporary postmodern latin american and caribbean literature especially in issues of race gender and class ma'am is the associate professor of spanish at the university of north carolina wilmington we thank you ma'am for taking the time to be with us today before we begin the session i would humbly request everyone to follow the netiquette and ask the queries when the floor is open for discussion thank you i would now humbly invite amrita ma'am please welcome ma'am the stage is all yours thank you aditi thank you very much um uh, i guess we are muted all of us but i thought i had i would begin by asking what you thought about magical realism but it seems that most of you have a more or less understanding of what magical realism is so i'll just kind of jump into uh some of some of the other um uh, ideas that i thought i would talk to you and this is going to be informal i want as i mentioned i want to read from anything uh i have my notes here on the screen i will so go through them and uh i'll keep it short and then hopefully we will have a conversation okay so let's first talk about where did the term magical realism come from so it is actually um uh it comes from a, the art world it has nothing to do with the literary world at least in its in its origin uh franz ro he is a german how he was a german art critic and in, in 1925 he published a book uh where he was talking about the post expressionist and so if you're familiar with art and uh, you might know what that looks like um uh in uh so he wrote this book where he uses the term magical realism as the subtitle of his book and of course this is a translation of course in, in german and i'm not going to try and um butcher german so i'm just going to use the english term magical realism and interestingly enough in 1927 the spanish intellectual um jose ortega y gasset he was a philosopher uh intellectual he had a magazine called revista de occidente magazine or journal of the west he translates this or rather his editorial team translates this work in um in his journal and publishes it and what's interesting is that the he decides to use magical realism as the title as the main title of the translation and he made some other changes where he left out certain parts of franchero's uh, work and this journal arrived in uh, latin america especially in argentina where there was this huge literary um circle where people read um uh, ortega y gasset revista de occidente and what's interesting is that this journal was mainly about literature it had literary essays and other translations of european literature so it's interesting that the readership in argentina they were interested in literature so when they read about uh, franchero's uh, critic about uh, post spanish expressionist uh, they kind of um, it's interesting how it's juxtaposed uh, amongst other essays that has to do with literature and so that's the first time this word appears in latin america in 1927 and at the beginning uh, many authors started using this magical realism for uh, uh, referring to european novels and not latin american novels the usage uh, in latin america does not start to 1949 that's the first time we see the use of latin uh, magical realism uh and it is done by an author from venezuela his name is arturo uslar pietri he writes a book called letras y hombres de venezuela letters and men of venezuela and he's talking about venezuelan literature um from the 19th early uh, uh, uh 20th century and he says he uses magical realism as a term to refer to many of the writings that is taking place in venezuela and 
and at the, at this time, uh, when when he was asked that if he had used this term, uh, if he had taken this term from Franz Rose, he said no. But it's interesting that later on he does admit that yes, probably he had read Franz Rose's essay somewhere, and that term magical realism kind of became part of his subconscious. But when he actually wrote the essay about Venezuelan writers, he was not actually thinking of the way Franz Rose was talking about art. He was simply, he had kind of, you know, taken uh, the term away from what he, you know, Roe had meant, and he kind of used it specifically to talk about Venezuelan writing. It's another thing that we have to think, uh, talk about is that prior to 1960, uh, Latin American literature uh, is kind of isolated in, in its own country. So Mexican authors are writing and they're only talking to themselves, Argentinian writers are writing and they're talking to themselves, and nobody is actually talking across the countries. But beyond 1960, we start to see a change where Mexican writers are reading Argentinian writers, Argentinian writers are reading Chilean writers, and that way. And, and, and another major thing is happening in 1960. There's a lot of things happening in 1960, but one of the major thing is that there's a Latin American consciousness um, coming out through the writers. They want to break away from the European mold. They don't want to follow what the French are doing or what the Spaniards are doing. They want to create that as something their own. So this is something that's very important in magical realism plays a big part in creating this Latin American consciousness. And um, as far as the term is concerned, there's a lot of confusion, especially at the beginning when, when people start using the term. Of course, uh, author, when they write, they are not thinking about these terms. They just write whatever, they, there's a story to tell. They use literary techniques. Yes, they might be innovating, but they're not really thinking, oh, I've got to use magical realism in, in my novel. It is, it is the critic that says, oh, you know, look at these narratives and, you know, we can see examples of magical realism. So in 1955, um, Angel Flores, he writes an essay called Magical Realism in Spanish-American Fiction. And he uses this term and he says that magical realism can be identified uniquely as something that is Latin American. So this is the first time we see like somebody is saying that this is unique to Latin America. But the examples that he uses kind of confuses people as to what he's trying to say. What does magical realism actually mean? And, and beyond this point, other critics also start using this term and they also keep talking about Latin America and the idea of reality and the fantastic. In 1967, Luis Leal, he's a Mexican critic. He also tries to uh, explain this term, but he tries to bring it closer to what Franz Roll, the German art critic, was talking about the, the post-expressionist. And so this kind of creates more confusion as to what the term is. And he even tried to bring Alejo Carpentier, who was a Cuban author, who had used a term called Lo Maravilloso, which can be loosely translated to The Marvelous. And so Luis Leal says, Carpentier's uh, uh, The Marvelous is kind of the same as uh, magical realism. And Carpentier was, no, no way. My Lo Maravilloso has nothing to do with uh, magical realism. So again, so there's more confusion. And so this debate ensued for some time. And more or less in 1975, one can say it was settled, but I, I think a debate can still continue. In 1975, there was this big conference in Michigan. Uh, uh, it was the conference of uh, Iberian literature, where it was decided that magical realism, yes, was Latin American, but it had nothing to do with what Franz Roe was talking about art in uh, Germany at the time, in Europe at the time in the 1920s. So that was decided, and so everybody agrees that Latin American uh, magical realism is something Latin American. We find that in Latin American authors. And of course, the most famous um, example is uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez's 1967 novel, 100 Years of Solitude. So like everybody, when you talk about Latin American literature, I get this question all the time when they ask, no, learn that I teach Spanish. Oh, have you read 100 Years of Solitude? And it's like, yes, I have read 100 Years of Solitude, but there are other novels as well. But of course, you know, the whole world kind of, you know, uh, recognizes that name. So what is magical realism? Of course, Aditi mentioned 
this idea of the fantastic. And, and if you read uh, uh, different people, they'll have different uh, definitions. As far as I'm concerned, I consider magical realism as a literary aesthetic, which is uh, in a realist narrative, it has to be realist, and where the author uses elements of the fantastic, so the supernatural, which we would consider illogical that cannot be explained by science or reason. And it is used to express a certain situation or an emotion or even a behavior of a character. So um, the, the ma for magical realism to be considered, you know, the, the, something to be considered, something fantastical to be considered magical realism is the, the narrative world, the characters. When something magical happens, they don't say like, oh, what's happening? You know, they, there is no, uh, uh, question of um, amazement, they just consider that, that it as part of the, the real, of the ordinary. So they are not questioning the fantastical world. And in, in many ways, um, I see this as a beginning of a postmodernist tradition in Latin America, which is kind of questioning the center, questioning the, the reality. You know, what is reality you know, or reality as objective? So here we start seeing reality as subjective. Different people see it as differently. What could something fantastical is ordinary for certain people. Other people who see reality only based on science and facts may see a different kind of reality. And the other thing that we have to realize that, as I had mentioned earlier, that in Latin America in the 60s, we see this uh, consciousness arising that we've got to create literature which is our own and does not have any influence uh, from, from the European uh, model. And Latin America, of course, has a, apart from European influences, it does uh, have a huge influence of Africa, a lot of African slaves, especially in the Caribbean, we see a lot of uh, African traditions and, and, and people and uh, uh, indigenous uh, traditions as well, even though a lot of the indigenous population is dead now, but we still have some indigenous population in different parts of Latin America. And of course, the Catholic tradition as well, which is you know, important because they have their own saints and their whole, um, that tradition as well. So this kind of mixes together and becomes a base for what, what the Latin American authors are using. Uh, there are a couple of other terms I mentioned earlier, lo maravilloso, the, the marvelous. There's another term called lo fantastico, or that can be uh, translated as a fantastic and not to be um, uh, kind of confused with fantasy. You know, we hear a lot about fantasy novels, so we, that's not um, the same term, it's a different term. Uh, and again, lo fantastico is not magical realism, and I'll talk about it. Uh, even though it kind of is questioning reality as well. So why do Latin American authors, or do we, when we see Latin American authors using uh, magical realism? Um, of course, there's this idea that they're trying to innovate, they're trying to create something that is uniquely Latin American. Um, they're trying to express their own reality in a, in a special way. But one other thing that is important is censorship. Many of these countries, um, in the all of 20th century, we see a um, lot of um, di uh, military dictatorship. So there are these authoritarian regimes and a lot of the rural population are not getting any of the benefits that perhaps some, some people in the urban centers are getting. So there's this desire to talk about what's happening in the country, but due to censorship, um, these authors are unable to do that freely. So they're using magical realism and kind of talking about certain things. Um, of course, uh, as I said, like magical realism becomes uh, uniquely Latin American because everybody's talking about it and everybody's using it. But there's also been an abuse of magical realism. And many authors feel, especially beyond uh, the 1960s, feel that you know, there's this intent, there's this almost like uh, everybody, when they talk about Latin American literature, only want um, uh, magical realism to be part of it. And we see this, especially in the publishing world, especially I can give you examples from the United States, people, uh, authors who are of Latin American descent, somehow the publishers expect that they will write 
the novel or write the narrative which will include magical realism. It is almost, it is exotic to use magical realism. And so that becomes a problem with many authors. And in the 1990s, uh, there is a group of Mexican authors, the five authors, um, they were all uh, college buddies, and they decide that they're going to break away from uh, this magical realism nonsense because they say Latin America has more to offer. So they are called the crack generation. And if you are interested, you can uh, crack like crack cocaine. And, and they write a manifesto. So you can look it up, crack the manifesto. And they talk about uh, Latin America being a different con uh, different uh, continent. And it's not a continent, but you know, like a just um, a cultural space. And they have a lot more to tell. And they're, they're also, uh, they're writing um, a realist narrative as well, but they are kind of staying away from magical realism. They're not saying that they will not use magical realism if it is um, needed, but they say like, I, they don't think it is required for them to express what Latin American reality is. And again, we see an example of this pushback in 2000 uh, by Alberto Foguet. He, uh, he writes a book called Macondo, M-C, like in McDonald's, M-C, Ondo, uh, O-N-D-O. And he's kind of parodying Macondo, M-A-C-O-N-D-A. Macondo is the fictional village that Gabriel Garcia uh, Marcus creates in his uh, novel 100 Years of Sol Solitude. So what he is doing is forget is saying that Latin America, mostly the authors who are writing in 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 2000, are uh, urban and their experience is very much different. They are influenced not so much by Europe, rather by United States, United States style capitalism. So Mac, like uh, McDonald's, Macintosh computers, and Ondo, of course, coming from uh, Marcus's uh, village, Macondo. So we're putting it together, and he's calling it Macondo. So there's this new generation of writers, Macondo generation, who would rather write about their own urban realism rather than fall back on use um, tropes like magical realism. So. Um, this is a couple of things, and then and I mentioned a little bit about certain other terms, and we can talk about that, or I can perhaps leave it for the questions. And I have a couple of other things. I have a couple of other narratives, other authors that I can mention. Um, uh, for example, uh, Alejo Carpentier, even though he claims he's not writing magical realism, his novel from 1949, uh, The Kingdom of the Soil, El Reino de Este Mundo, is considered an example of magical realism. Of course, Marcus's 1967, 100 Years of Solitude, then much more contemporary, uh, well, it's probably old now since we are in 2000, um, uh, 2021, uh, Isabel Allende's uh, The House of the Spirits, La Casa de los Espíritus in 1982, and then the Mexican author, Laura Esquivel's um, Como Agua para Chocolate, Like Water for Chocolate, that's published in 1990. So these are some examples. There are other examples where we can find authors using uh, magical realism. Okay, I'll stop here for now. And then let's break uh, for questions and then we can continue. Uh, um, all right, so. I see a few things in the chat. If anyone has any question, they can unmute their mic. So maybe chat in the chat box. I don't think they'll be able to unmute. I think they'll have to type in their question. Raise your hands and I'll unmute. Then I sort of had a question uh, regarding magic realism. Uh, Ma'am, like uh, sometimes it becomes difficult to understand if that text has magic realism or not. Because uh, for example, in Beloved, uh, I was pretty skeptical whether to call it magical realism or not because the reasons are given uh, in the text that uh, why the ghost is there. Yeah. So, so, of course, many people, <clears throat> many people consider Toni Morrison's Beloved as, as an example of, of magical realism. I haven't read it, so I, I cannot really uh, talk about it. 
And I think it's up to the reader. Um, and as I said, there's a lot of abuse of the term, you know, just because there's some, some fantastical term. It is kind of understood that normally when an author uses magical realism, they will not explain it because there's nothing to explain because the author feels that the, the characters understand why something magical is happening because it's part of the ordinary. And so the reader must also accept it as something ordinary. So yes, if there is an explanation going on, so there's an intent uh, on, on the author's part to kind of explain why this is magical. So yes, I, I think it, it, as, as a reader, as a critic, you have the right to decide if this is magical realism or not. So you can of course take that, um, um, point of view and say, you know, if, if the author is trying to explain, then this is not ordinary. This is something that is supernatural and that needs explanation. So yeah, certainly you can argue that. So you, you, as you know, literary criticism, there's never one answer. There are many answers and all, it all depends on as long as you can provide um, evidence for it. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. So uh, we also have a question from Raba. Uh, she's asking, how do we differentiate between magical realism and fantasy? Okay, good question. So fantasy, as you know, if you, if you were to think of uh, Harry Potter or Hunger Games, I'm thinking of these, I'm not a big uh, fantasy um, uh, reader, uh, but the whole idea about fantasy is that uh, the, uh, the reader already knows that there is going to be a fantastical world, that there is going to be magic. Whereas in magical realism, that's not the case. It is a realist novel. It is expected that the reader is reading about reality or a real-like real situation, uh, lifelike situation. And yes, if magic happens, then the reader is expected to accept as part of um, the ordinary. But a fantasy is not magical realism. Fantasy because is there's an expectation from the beginning that there is going to be magic in it. Uh, Satya, yeah, ma'am. Yes. Yeah. All right. Good evening, ma'am. Yeah. So you gave a brief idea regarding that Mekondo generation, right? So like you told me about, like you told us what uh, like short stories that were written in the nineties regarding you know the the Venezuelan cities, the Ecuadorian cities, and all that. And you know they tried to show the glum reality of those cities, right? Uh, the the Uruguay, Paraguay side of it. Latin America. So I just wanted to ask, uh, so can you please enhance, you know, can you please just elaborate more on that? Like, are there still writers that write up regarding, you know, that era? Or they just, you know, refine it with their new language and tell about the real reality of today's era, to today's uh, reality of that? So you're, you're asking yeah. about the Nakondo generation. I, I would, yes, I would consider... Yes, yeah, even though uh, Fouquet is uh, writes that in, in early 2000 that that book comes out, um, I think we can still consider the authors are kind of part of that generation. And what's interesting about this generation, they are transnational. And when I say transnational, many of them come and go or live part, some of them, not all of them, partially in the United States and, and, and a partial time in, in the US uh, and in Latin American cities. And um, of course, because of the way technology has advanced, there is so much connection between the United States and Latin America. You know, you, you know, look at us, we're talking, we're thousands of miles apart and we're talking. So information uh, can get across in, in seconds. People are talking to each other. Uh, as a matter of fact, on Facebook uh, or all the social media that we have, people, so authors are constantly talking to each other. The moment somebody publishes a book, it is announced on social media and the whole world knows about it. So this generation, Macondo generation, it's not just glum reality. It is basically the way they see their urban reality and which is highly influenced with US style capitalism. So that is what they're talking about. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, we have a question in the chat box by Soumya Dhulia. Uh, she's asking uh, that magical realism often contains implicit political critique. As you pointed out, it was used by several Latin American writers to circumvent circum censorship under authoritarian regimes. What is it about this particular literary mode 
that allows for such subversion? Um, yeah, so of course, as I mentioned that, yes, there are a lot of, because of the authoritarian regimes, a uh, um, lot of people use this style, but this is not the only style that one, one can use. You know, as a matter of fact, uh, science fiction, science fiction has always been a mode that has been used to subvert um, uh, authoritarian regimes, because, you know, you can you know, talk about a world that is in the future, and then, then you're saying, oh, well, I'm not talking about the present time. So and you can critique uh, the regime, you know? And, and so again, so this, this magical realism is not the only way to subvert, but this of course allowed by using this fantastical element uh, and the way a character is behaving or reacting uh, to, the, to, the, to the situation that allows them to do things that you probably couldn't do in real life. So um, that is one I, I can say would be would be an example. <clears throat> All right, ma'am. Uh, moving on to Harsh Harsh's question, he is asking that uh, how can we consider psych reading as an element of magic realism? Psych reading can you explain that a little bit more. What do you mean by psych reading? Would you like to unmute your mic, Harsh? Harsh, you can unmute your mic and you know elaborate on your question a little. I think uh, there is something you said. Somebody will have to unmute him. Okay. Yeah, he has his um, hand raised up. Okay, ma'am. Done. Harsh, please unmute. Harsh, could you please unmute your mic? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening. Ma'am, actually, psych reading, I want to ask that. Uh, psych reading in some in science uh, that uh, by using hypnotists, and science has explained that by using hypnotists, we can uh, read some of the memory of a person or experiences. But in science, you said that uh, uh, magic realism is, uh, is related to reality, but uh, along with some fantasy elements. So in the sense that uh, psych reading is possible to some to some extent by using hypnotism. So can we relate it to magic realism because uh, not completely we can uh, find out what a person uh, has suffered in the past. We can, mm -hmm. we can just uh, gather a bit of knowledge by using hypnotism. So uh, okay. that's another question. Okay. Uh, um as far as I, I have never thought of it uh, this way, but uh, if I understand hypnotism is, is it what it tries to do is get in, go down into our subconscious you know, things that we generally do not remember or, or cannot you know, figure out. But uh, when, when a, a psychologist or psychiatrist tries that, that form is, is basically trying to delve into your subconscious. So it's, it's there, it's part of you in some part of your brain and that they're trying to reach. Um, so, I have not really thought of it as uh, magical realism because um, it, one here you could probably you can explain it through psychology. Of course, a lot of people say psychology is pseudoscience; it's not science. But you know, I'm not going to debate that. I'm not a psychologist, so I'm not going to say that. But um, I I'm not sure if we would consider hypnotism as part of magical realism. Um, I, I cannot answer that question definitely, but I, in my opinion, just based on you know just a prompt question like that, uh, I wouldn't consider that. But there's something that you can certainly look into. Maybe you can find if there's some writing about that that might be interesting. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, there's a question by Ash. Uh, the question is, what is the difference between fantasy and fantastical? Okay, so when we talk about fantasy, we generally talk of a, a certain kind of genre. So uh, fantasy is associated with a certain kind of writing. Um, um, again, I'm not a, a big reader of fantasy novels, but uh, so um, uh, I think uh, Harry Potter is called urban fantasy and there are other, other kinds of fantasy. So as I explained before, fantasy, in the, in the fantasy genre, it is presumed that what you're going to see is going to be magical. It is going to be not real. So that's there's that presumption. And fantastical is, of course, 
you're just using that term to refer to anything that is magical that is not part of uh, reality. And talking about fantastical, let me also refer to uh, another term that we associate with um, Latin American literature from kind of the same period by, with authors like Jorge Luis Borges or Julio Cortazar. Um, in Spanish, we call it lo fantástico, and it loosely translates to the fantastic. And of course, you're just taking the adjective and creating a noun out of it. And in, in that, uh, what authors do is, yes, they use certain elements of magic, but at that, in, in that kind of narrative, um, there is an idea that the reader is going to question that is this really real? Uh, for example, there's a story that um, uh, I, I, I teach uh, to my, my students uh, when, you, when you're in the reading class, uh, where uh, an, a, a person is reading a novel, and it's a mystery novel, and the mystery novel, um, there's a couple who are planning a murder and he reads that somebody comes up the house, comes up the steps, opens the door, and sees a man sitting on this in this high high chair and smoking and reading a book. And that's the same scene as our own reader who is sitting in this room in this um, um, kind of a rural area, reading a book and smoking a cigar. So, like this whole idea: is he reading about his own life? So there's this questioning. Uh, of, of, of reality. Of course, that, that's where the story ends, so we never know what happens next. So readers are supposed to figure out, oh, is this, did this really happen? Is this, did the, the, the fictional world of the book collide with our fictional world? So there's this question. So that is fan lo fantastico. And that is not magical realism because that is not being considered as part of the ordinary. So there are all these different modes that different authors use, fantasy, the fantastic, magical realism that use elements of uh, what is not life, like uh, logical, um, but uh, they are all different. Like this kind of kind of these subtle differences. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, there's a question. Uh, there are two questions actually. The first one is, what is the main purpose of magical realism? And the second is, uh, as you mentioned, that the term was used by a post-impressionist artist. So has magical realism been used by artists of other mediums as well? Or is it just something specific to literature? OK, so uh, all right, there were a couple of questions, right? So what is the main purpose of magical realism? So the main purpose, of course, there is no author is using magical realism for any specific purpose. Like, many critics who have read these and they say that they, it is used to kind of subvert um, censorship, you know, subvert certain regimes. But I would also say that simply it's kind of talking about a reality um, that they're trying to create that is not what is considered the, as the official reality. So it's kind of breaking away. So like our reality, Latin American authors are saying our reality from at least from that period is saying it's our reality is different from your reality. Yes, we consider magic as part of our lives. There's nothing, nothing, um, um, you know, fantastical about it. It is you know, something that we do every day. Okay. And what was the other question about the post-expressionist? Um, as I said, I'm not a art critic, so I, I can, I enjoy art as I see it, but um, I do not know the different schools, or I can, nor can I talk about them. Uh, uh, of course. Well, uh, what's interesting is that, uh, as I mentioned, Fran, Franz Rowe's book, uh, where he used magical realism as the subtitle of his book, his, the main title was New Objectivity. And that is the term that became popular to talk about that art form or you know, the way they were using light and things like that. And so New Objectivity is the term that the artists use to explain that kind of art, whereas it's in the literary world that we start using uh, magical realism. I have never heard magical realism in any other context used for art form, but of course, I'm not an art critic. I do not specialize, so you know, I probably could not answer that. But you could always, you know, Google it and you know, magical realism and art, and see if something pops up. I'm sure somebody must have tried to put them together. Okay, did, 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 Aditi, was there another yes, question? Uh, yeah. Ma'am, there is another question uh, about, is there any correlation between postmodernism and magical realism? Uh, 
I I would I I would consider yes uh, that the the very fact that they're trying trying to talk about about a reality that is not the official reality so like it's kind of breaking away because in in at least in Latin America when we talk about post uh, postmodernism we see it mostly in the 70s we see a lot more uh, female authors women authors writing a lot of gay writers coming up and they're talking about things that were were not being talked about earlier so they are talking about realities so they're trying to say there is not one reality so and i think magical realism kind of hints to that maybe that was not their purpose they were rather trying to build this national or latin american narrative um, you know in but there is this hint that we are trying to break away uh, as to what is considered the reality. And they're trying to say they are subjective reality in that sense. Right, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, there's a question uh, 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 which says that when an author tries to uh, write a text of magical realism, so does it uh, does the author intend it to be accepted within the context only? Or does it have to go outside uh, the outside the text, like outside the context of the text. Hmm. I I think I mean as as somebody who's a skeptic, as somebody who believes in science, I see it as only as part of the narrative word, the magical realism. As, and as I said, it's it, it's a literary aesthetic. It's a technique that somebody is trying to use to tell me a story. And so I'm not going to really think that that really happened. Of course, people, you know. Latin America, especially with so much Catholic tradition, people constantly see the Virgin Mary, and you know, and and, and shrines are, are built on, on where the vision was uh, seen. So that person, of course, believes that Virgin Mary or Jesus or whoever appeared to them. Now, I, frankly speaking, somebody who believes in science don't believe that actually happened. That was something perhaps you know. In, in our mind because you believe something so strongly, so deeply that you, you want to see that and that's what you see. Um, for, so therefore, for me, magical realism, I don't see, think the author is saying that this magical is actually real, but what they're saying is that, yes, this is part of our reality. Many people do consider magic as part of uh, ordinary life. And of course, they're just kind of talking. It's a story, it's, it's fiction. And I don't think there's this intent I don't think Marcus or um, uh, some of the authors are trying to say like, this is real life. All right, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, there's a question by Tanya. Uh, she's asking if hallucination is different from magical realism. And I remember uh, a text uh, that was the yellow wallpaper and there was uh, something about yellow wallpaper that, is there something about it that could be included in magical realism? I'm yeah, sure. I mean, I, I... As long as it is not explained as hallucination, you know, it's not saying, oh, somebody saw a hallucination. If it is just part of the narrative, this character sees this and has a conversation with this or whatever it is, I guess it could be, it could be considered magical realism. But that whole idea that it should not be explained. The moment you explain it, then you're trying to say, this is not part of real life. This is out of the ordinary. So let me explain to you, this is not actually happening. Somebody is just hallucinating. All right, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, there are some similar questions like can folk and fairy tales be regarded yeah. as magical realism? And what so again, other? yeah, so again, I think um, it, it goes back to this question of, you know, in folk tales and fairy tales, there's a presumption that yes, we are going to see fairies and, and, and you know, things that, that are not uh, part of the real life. So since the reader already knows that, uh, it is not considered magical realism. For magical realism to take place, it, it has to be a realist narrative. And, and suddenly something out of the ordinary, something magical appears, and that is also kind of considered part of reality. So yeah, again, so fantasy is not magical realism. Science fiction is not magical realism. Folk tale is, is not, um, not uh, or fairy tales are not magical realism for that, for that purpose. Um, thanks. Yeah. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Ma'am, there's this final question, I think, because of the shortage of time. Uh, it's, a, it's a little specific question by Khushi, and she's asking in what ways is Marquez's way of using magical realism different from Salman Rushdie's? All right. I have not read Salman Rushdie, so I really cannot comment on that. Uh, 
so I guess you will have to make that uh, decision. And you'll have to read both the novels and, and kind of see uh, um, what it is that uh, Rushdie is doing and then what Marcus is doing. Right, ma'am. And ma'am, uh, Swati is uh, asking the question. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, authors often leave uh, more concealed than revealed in stories of magical realism. Uh, how does this authorial ret reticence contribute to the narrative? Uh, again, if, if they're not, let's say we just talked about that the magic is not explained. And so therefore you may talk about that is that person trying to conceal something and not kind of explain us. And I think that that's where the reader comes into, uh, becomes part, an active reader. Uh, you know, it, it is up to you to decide as to what it is that the author is trying to tell, tell us. Again, everybody's going to have a different interpretation. And, and therefore, the, I mean, it, it is the author, you know, sometimes when you read 100 Years of Solitude, I mean, you are questioned, like you're questioning, so why is Marcus using this? And then it kind of tells you, let me go ahead and read what was happening in that America in 1960. What is Columbia going through 1960s? And you try to read history, you try to see what is the historical context, what is the social context, and that gives more meaning to any, 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 any reader. Of course, you know, there are all kinds of different readers. You as, as students of literature, you would want to do that. You would want to figure out as to what was happening in Colombia in the 1960s or in Latin America in the 60s and the 70s. Whereas uh, other, you know, somebody who's casually reading it, you know, oh, fun, fun reading, magic happens, you know, they close the book and they move on. All right, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much for such an engaging session. And I think uh, uh, Aditi Manjula has a question. I okay, think. Okay, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Dr. Amrita Das. Uh, thank you so much. And you can uh, gauge for yourself how much our students have benefited from your talk. I'm sure the questions would go on. I personally have, uh, you know, uh, two observations, which I'm not very sure because, uh, you know, I want you to uh, tell me whether I, uh, you know, this is the right uh, kind of what I understand. And then a question, okay. So one observation is, um, you know, regarding, there was a particular question regarding the folk, uh, you know, folklore and, uh, um, let's say legends, myths, etc. So, in terms of my understanding and what I uh, further convey, maybe rightly or maybe not, to the students is that they are not as such magic realism as you said, but the very uh, capaciousness of the mode allows uh, for me, as I understand, with all its gaps, you know, which are there in the mode teasing the reader, as you uh, pointed out, mm -hmm. you know, to figure out the meaning and meaning could be multiple possibilities, etc. deliberately hidden in terms of authorial reticence. But mm -hmm. I feel that this kind of a capaciousness, it is uh, in terms of maybe the novels that I have read, especially, it allows the author to plummet the collective psyche in, uh, you know, in such a comprehensive way. Uh, what one would say is collective psyche or social psychology, if, you know, in that sense. So I mm -hmm. think it really includes, um, uh, you know, all these, um, any mm -hmm. specific communities, legends, myths, folk tales, uh, you know, whatever the so-called yeah. paraphernalia, the rational, the irrational. So uh, would you grant that? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think folk tales tell the story, I mean, because they're coming from what we could, would call ordinary people. I mean, it is not somebody, you know, high up there was writing. Of course, somebody may have written it because they heard it amongst the folk, you know, because we use this folk is because we're not calling them as, as literate or intellectuals. They are regular people. And so if regular people are telling stories and, you know, of course, most, many of them are passed down through oral tradition and sometimes like somebody comes along, Grimm comes along and he writes them down. And so, uh, there is, of course, there is that, that, is, that a society or a culture, they accept it as part of their history in, in, in a way. And, you know, in a, there's this whole debate about what is history. And of course, you know, historians will say only which that is, you know, you can show evidence, you can show facts. And even historians, what are they doing? They are basically creating a story, trying to, you know, kind of link the missing pieces. And, and, and folk 
uh, the people, normal people are there trying to tell their own story, their own history through these folk tales. Yes, they're using fantastical elements and, and magic and things like that, but it is, it is their story, it's their history. Yes, Absolutely. their worldview, you know, worldview yes, of yes. a specific community, a specific people, you know, in that sense Absolutely. where they are located. Um, my uh, second observation, which again, uh, because Shivani is there uh, also, uh, very often um, I find that some of these techniques, you know, suddenly, for example, out of nowhere, you will have obscenity, you will have uh, um, nudity, you know, uh, you will have scatological humor. So these are the various other uh, techniques which are part of this mode in a way that go on. And I think those are, these are deliberately there. I sometimes maybe incorrectly refer to them as techniques of defamiliarization, you know, jolting the reader out of yes. the conventional yes. way of thinking. So I think both yes. you and Shivani can comment on it because, uh, you know, uh, going back to Brechtian um, use of the term, I really don't know how right or wrong it is, but sometimes I borrow that concept also, you know, it, trying to explain how this, the, it is working suddenly, you know, where does the nudity come in? Where does that sudden, uh, you know, these minor seamless kind of, uh, um, you know, suddenly you feel, well, what is this oddity? What is this doing? Uh, so, yeah, yes, your <laughs> comment on that. Sh Shivani, did you want to comment on that? Uh, in fact, when I was think I was reading up a little bit, you know, before your talk, okay, because I don't teach this paper at all, okay, and in fact, uh, uh, Manjula, you know, it's uh, interesting because I thought of that too, okay, because I, I teach Brecht, huh? mm -hmm. so you know what I was reading about magic realism, okay, the, and and I, you know, the simplest way in which I would explain defamiliarization to my students is to make you know the real uh, something re uh, normal, something regular, strange, okay, the mm -hmm. idea of making you know, estrangement okay that uh, Brett uh, brings about and but he uses it for a very very political purpose uh, to make the you know the regular the accepted strange okay abnormal or not abnormal strange okay for a very political reason uh, do you think magic realism also has a similar agenda a political agenda I don't know if the agenda is is similar I mean, I mean, of course, there is that, that you know, since you're writing um, within this mold of censorship, because you know that uh, if you say anything against the regime, you know, you can be captured, you can be tortured, um, and a lot of things can happen to you. So, of course, they, they have to look for tools where they can express something. So, yes, it is a tool um, uh, to kind of, you know, it, it does, you know, even, I, I'm not saying that they, there's an element of shock, but the idea is um, the author is supposed to look at it and okay, this is magic. This is not something that happens in real life. And but they must continue to read it as as part of the narrative, and you know, not be say like, oh, this cannot happen. And so there's this this accepting that in real life, strange things do happen. And so, you know, in, in that sense, it could be an underlying thing, like, yes, there are a lot of strange things that are happening in the country right now, in our nation right now, that nobody's really talking or can cannot talk against. Uh, can I, uh, do we have the time, uh, Shivani, or we need to- Of find course, that? of course. Okay, yeah. Yeah. so uh, can I add uh, Dr. Amrita? Uh, that's with your, uh, I don't know, again, you know, because you are the specialist, so it, I almost feel like... I, as you know, I said, I'm not the specialist. <laughs> but it's a good discussion. So uh, yeah. thanks, Shivani, for bringing in the idea of uh, political critique. I'm not very sure whether in the Brechtian uh, sense, uh, maybe, maybe not. But the very fact that, you know, um, I mean, uh, we can teach these authors. I think we teach them otherwise, uh, maybe... Uh, but we, uh, I mean, uh, sorry, let me frame it in a better way. Uh, in uh, At Delhi University, we've been teaching these authors, let's say Marquez, and then um, in another course also we have, uh, you know, um, which is a BA program course, we have authors like Claris Lispector, uh, please excuse my pronunciation, it's a terrible uh, North Indian uh, <laughs> English. Uh, with no <laughs> whatever pretension of even getting the Spanish uh, intonation. And, uh, you know, um, uh, we have uh, Rosa's, the third bank of the river. We have Octavio Paz's also. 
so um, i don't know uh, but what i mean is that we teach it under the rubric of post colonial literature so in yeah. any case we have to hinge it on to a larger uh, you know the historicity if we go back in terms of uh, you know the legacy of post colonial uh, you know sorry like legacy of colonial uh, occupation mm -hmm. plunder in fact uh, which i what i need to move on now Uh, with my third year honor students is uh, you know reference uh, to the political import of marquez's uh, nobel prize acceptance speech you know where uh, not so much in the novel but um, you know where he but in the acceptance speech he brings out uh, you know how wonderfully uh, his uh, you know it was uh, a felicitation ceremony as we all know but he really turned upon his hosts to remind them you know with the uh, you know about their uh, uh, the depredations the plunder and like he said we never needed the imagination um, you know uh, your excesses the excesses that you committed upon our land have actually been the source of our creativity and mm -hmm. of uh, and of whatever is magical in our texts and then mm -hmm. you know he goes on to of course uh, refer to um, the uh, bipolar world and how latin america continues to be a pawn amidst all that so of course it is a speech loaded with political import and in a very mm -hmm. uh, specific uh, you know the bipolar world of the 1980s etc etc but uh, beyond that political specific reference uh, i think even in terms of social critique political critique um, i uh, for example um, amongst a whole lot of uh, secondary readings which are so uh, is you know brilliantly available uh, i find uh, our own indian uh, scholar of high repute i don't know whether you uh, i'm sure uh, i you must be i don't know whether you make as much use of her writings as i do kumkum sangari right uh, mm -hmm. she uh, her um, uh, essay i use uh, and uh, i find that she uh, i think she it was uh, she considers magic realism especially used by marquez as a non mimetic mode you know it's situated in reality but it is a non mimetic mode because it is interrogatory you know so it is excellent i think in terms of the it could be directed towards political critique you know for example in uh, his uh, nobel prize acceptance speech look at the kind of irony look at the kind of fun he has you know mm -hmm. reminding his hosts of uh, you know uh, the kind of excesses committed uh, going on to um, despotic uh, craze you know the craziness of despots who ruled you know neo feudal mm -hmm. formations etc you know and uh, also in terms of the social critique for example if one novel 100 years of solitude is about um, political historical determinism social determinism you know critiques uh, etc so i think uh, shibani going back to i don't know whether in the brechtian sense but i do feel that this is a mode which lends itself with all its gaps you know that sense of estrangement it lends itself brilliantly uh, to uh, both social critique political uh, critique you know in that sense so uh, uh, dr das uh, uh, would you agree with it and i don't know what uh, shibani uh, would yes say. yeah i mean certainly uh, in, in as i as you mentioned that there are there is critique that is going on because you know the very fact that you you uh, author is trying to write about a different reality uh, uh, that is not considered the official reality that itself is a critique i mean why would an author try try to create a world if if it already exists or if everybody is already familiar with absolutely. it absolutely absolutely yeah and, yeah i mean of course i mean um, you know when you talk about uh, post colonial in latin america it is so different from mm. post colonial in africa or in, mm. in asia in mm. india and things like that because you know the the english came to india they they looted us and they left you know or we 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 pushed them out uh but whereas in in latin america europeans the spaniards and the portuguese they came and they settled there yes. and of course they brought in africans as slaves and they they killed the native uh, population so and when they did win their uh, freedom from spain it was the white it was the it was the europeans who were born in latin american countries that because they could not um get these uh, ruling positions that they kicked out the spaniards so mm -hmm. it's a different kind of Of, absolutely yes 
And of course, uh, since 19th century, United States has always been this colonial power, like a neo-colonial power, um, you know, using um, money uh, to kind of rule or dictate terms in Latin America. So there's a different kind of post-colonial literature. Yes. One would talk about Latin America, you know, which is not the same as when we do talk about uh, African or, yes. or uh, Asian uh, Asian nations. Yeah, absolutely. I think, and that's why, again, you know, again, as I said, these are my insights from Kumkum Sangri. You know, it is something that actually incorporates miscegenation, uh, simultaneity, hybridity, cultural hybridity. You know, all those that you mentioned right now. That how Latin American, um, you know, post-colonial context is uh, so much different from elsewhere, etc. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, you're absolutely right. I have my last question, a little, uh, if you put, uh, I uh, am always fascinated with Cervantes, you know, the Spanish uh, <laughs> uh, great author going back uh, 16th century, I think, or if I'm not wrong, mm -hmm, or mm -hmm, later. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, 17th, yeah. Yeah, so uh, are there, uh, I mean, of course, I'm sure in terms of his ironic stance, uh, even in Cervantes, there would be the ironic distance, authorial distance, I suppose. But mm -hmm. uh, to what extent uh, is that an enduring influence that you find? Because uh, Marquez, of course, there are these, uh, I've read uh, that, uh, you know, a lot of uh, Marquesian style is actually, uh, could be the influence also of Cervantes you know, mm -hmm. uh, or, uh, but uh, in terms of other Latin American texts that you referred and which could be even contemporary writing, do you see that as an enduring influence? I mean, I guess Cervantes is, uh, you know, Don Quixote is such a, in, for, for, for the time, and of course, the, the way it has endured, does tell you that it, it is, is, it's a very important text that, that came out. Of course, uh, you know, we have to think about in, in the, the time period that Cervantes was writing it, and it, it, he was actually making fun of these, uh, these chivalry you know, yes. these novels yeah. about the, the concept of knighthood and things like that. And, you know, he created this, you know, almost like a fool-like character, but a lovable mm -hmm. fool that we, we have in, in Quixote. Um, and of course, I think it has influenced over, over ages, um, you know, different, uh, different writers. Um, I, I'm not sure if um, uh, Marquez was influenced by Cervantes, if he takes directly from Cervantes or not, but I'm, I'm sure he, he at some point had read it. You know, it, it's, such a, it's such a, a narrative that most people, you know, at least in Latin American literary circles would have read it. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. You've been so patient, thank you. <laughs> Dr. Das. Right. Over to you, Aditi. Thank you, ma'am. And uh, thank you, Amrita, ma'am, for being so patient, as Majula ma'am said. Uh, now I would like to invite Shibani, ma'am, for a vote of thanks. Uh, before I give a vote of thanks, uh, Amrita, I was also struck uh, by all this conversation about magic, etc., and magic realism, that there is actually a village a few kilometers away from Gohati in Assam, called Mayong. Huh? The name itself, you know, the, the etymology of, you know, of that village comes from the word Maya illusion, which uh -huh. is known to practice uh, black magic. Like, uh, the entire, there's a, the community of people there from generations who've been known to sort of practice uh, black magic. And we do have very young writers from that uh, place, okay, in whose writing you see a lot of you know, elements of magic present uh, so the in the stories you would have you know strange things you know pay, books in which pages would turn by themselves or you know things like that okay and it's 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 quite interesting to sort of see that and and, and sort of uh, <laughs> look at what happens in uh, magic realism uh, so true, true. Uh, complete aside but yeah thank you so much uh, for you know joining us i know it's very early in the morning so this time difference and you know she has a uh, terrible back issues uh, so despite all of that you know so uh, i know it's it must have been difficult for you to sit 
uh, for uh, for this law. Huh? So thank you very much. Thank you for being so patient and for answering so many questions and queries. And, you know, and it was just wonderful to have you because, uh, you know, I think I did mention it to some some people. Amrita is my batchmate. She is my classmate. And the last I heard her sort of doing something like this was probably when both of us were in college in a little yeah. classroom in Indraprastha College. OK, so it uh, so this is this was really, really uh, nice. So thank you very much. Thank you to all my colleagues who were present. Uh, you know, thank you, especially to Manjula, who sort of, you know, who, uh, you know, I think made the discussion, you know, who can contributed in a very meaningful way to the discussion. Thank you to all those who've attended and the English Association. You guys are really, really great. Huh? So I need to sort of prod and, and scold you a bit at times, but then you guys <laughs> just do an amazing stellar job each time. Huh? So thank you to all of you. Uh, thank you, Ravinder, who's uh, the host. And I you know he's had a long day and he's again had to sort of do this for us. Huh? So thank you very much, Ravinder. Thank you, everybody, and thank you, Amrita. Thank you once again. You're welcome, and in you know, it was this was a pleasure. You know, 